All right, let's get into the Word. If you have your Bibles, Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is the second of a two-part sermon. It's just one sermon. It's not really a series. It's a two-part sermon. I introduced it last week. It's called A New Commandment from Jesus. And in last week's sermon, we began talking about this new commandment, one that Jesus issued on the very night in which he was betrayed. So I want to begin by reading the first of the two verses that we looked at last week in John 13, and it is verse 34, where Jesus said, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another. This commandment was new, not in the sense that that had never been commanded before. We know that God has always wanted his people to love others. But it was new in quality, new in nature. No one had ever loved like Jesus did. We also looked at the source of our love, which of course we know God or Jesus is the source. We spent some time seeing what Jesus said the result would be if we obey this command. The world is going to be impacted. There is nothing more important for us than to share the love of Jesus with others. And people will know that we are Jesus' disciples and many more souls will be added to the kingdom if we love like Jesus loved. So we haven't been left in the dark about how this love is to be expressed. Jesus has shown us through his word, which is the standard of our behavior. So here's what I want to do today. I want to take a little deeper look into this kind of love that Jesus showed to other people. Now, we touched on it last week. You remember what he did on that same night? They were together for what we call the Last Supper. And Jesus took the towel, wrapped it around his waist, and he washed the disciples' feet. And what he was doing was showing that the way to love others is to become a servant or a slave to others. And that's exactly the point he was making. We also learned that this love of God, this love that Jesus showed is not based on emotion it's simply a choice that we want to make that we want what's best for every person that we love all four gospels speak of this wonderful love of Jesus and I believe there are at least five characteristics about the love of Jesus that are worthy for us to share with others so that's what we're going to do talk about these five characteristics of the love of Christ but before we do that as we always do, let's ask God for his blessing, his wisdom, and his understanding as we make applications and practice loving one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day again. We know you're here with us. Thank you for the songs. What a great song service. Thank you for being able to come around your table to consider our tithes and offerings. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you give to all of us in the many ways in which you do. Father, today we're going to talk about a subject that there's nothing more important than this. This new commandment of Jesus that we love one another as he has loved us. That's the key, Father, to seeing your church grow. And so, Father, I pray for your help in presenting this message in a way that will be pleasing to you. It is important that we understand how Jesus loved, and then we need your help in order to practice that today as we love others. So, Lord, use me in a way that will be pleasing to you. May we all be challenged and encouraged to love one another as Jesus has loved us. That's my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get right to these five characteristics that Jesus has shown. Number one, the love of Jesus was and is unconditional. Well, sometimes you've, you've heard preachers say that, you know, God loves unconditionally. And all that means is his love was without respect of persons. He chose to love the unlovely. He chose to love people who had been rejected by others, those who were looked down on by society. And he loved them not because they had this fuzzy, warm feeling, but because they needed to be loved. The world loves those who they consider to be deserving of their love, but our Lord loved people regardless 
of their condition. And so there are no ifs attached to authentic, unconditional love. And Jesus gave us many examples of that. Two examples of his unconditional love are Zacchaeus, found in Luke 19, and the woman caught in adultery, found in John chapter 8. I'm just going to give you a very quick paraphrase of each of these stories because of who these people were that Jesus loved. The Bible describes Zacchaeus as a chief tax collector. Now, I'm not going to get into that other than to say this. That meant he wasn't liked by anybody. A chief tax collector, no one respected. No one liked a chief tax collector. Well, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. But because the crowd was large and he was short, he decided to climb up into a sycamore tree to see him. Jesus knew what was happening. He looks at Zacchaeus. He says, Zacchaeus, come on down because I'm coming over to your place. And he did. And when Jesus went to the house of this chief tax collector, the other people didn't like that. How dare Jesus go to this tax collector and fellowship with him? Verse 7 puts it this way in Luke 19. When the people saw this, they all began to complain, saying, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Oh, how terrible Jesus was to go to the house of a sinner. But that didn't faze Jesus at all. In fact, after Zacchaeus told Jesus he would make things right with those that he had overcharged as a tax collector, Jesus said salvation has come to his house. The other example of unconditional love that I want to use today is found in John 8, where while Jesus was teaching in the temple, the scribes and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. So he was being challenged to see if he was going to condemn her as the Old Testament law allowed to stone her to death. And that's when Jesus shared those precious words that I'm sure you've heard before. John 8, verse 7, Jesus said, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. When no one picked up a stone and they all began to walk away, Jesus told her, go and sin no more. Now, in both of these examples, Jesus showed his love for people who were very unlovely, at least in the minds of those who were around them. Our world today has taught us to say, I love you if you do a certain thing or you behave in a certain way, or I love you because you act or look in a way that I approve. Or in some people's case, I love you so that I can get something from you. But the love of Jesus says, I love you. No strings attached. I love you, period. And I, here's what I want you to know when you leave here today. I want you to know it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life at Calvary for you. That's the message of Christianity. And that's why I want you to leave here understanding without any shadow of a doubt. Let me share this story. I think I shared this several years ago, but it's a neat story. And I think it illustrates this unconditional love of Jesus. It took place many years ago in Seattle, Washington. The special event that was talked about for years later was the 100-yard dash. Lined up on the starting line were nine contestants. At the gun, they started their run. Well, kind of. You see, this was the Special Olympics, a competition for physically or mentally challenged people. The nine young men and women were filled with excitement as they ran and laughed and raced toward the finish line. But one little boy, as soon as he started, he stumbled on the asphalt. He tumbled over a couple of times, fell on his face, and he was crying. The other eight heard him. All eight of them slowed down and looked back. And then every single one of them turned around, went back to the boy that had fallen, and a little girl with Down syndrome bent down 
and kissed him and said, this will make it better. Then all nine linked arms and they walked together to the finish line. Everyone in the stadium that day stood up and the applause went on for what seemed like hours. What had the audience seen that day? They had seen unconditional love in action. Is our love to others unconditional? Second characteristic, the love of Jesus was and is unselfish. Too often we love based on what we will receive in return for our love. But Jesus never thought of himself. His one desire was to give himself and all that he had for those he loved. And so John could write in 1 John 3 verse 16, We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. Now that begs a question, what does Jesus mean here? Are we to allow our hands and feet to be nailed to a cross for a friend? Well, that doesn't happen very often, and I hope it doesn't happen with you. So I think John explains what he means in the very next verse, 1 John 3, 17, when he said this, But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? The answer is it doesn't. James said in James 2, beginning in verse 15, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. And yet, you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? The answer is, it isn't any use. When we fail to show concern for people who have needs that we can meet, then we are not showing the love that Jesus commands us to show. It's very simple. You see a need, you meet a need. If you can. That's what the love of Jesus is. And it's only when I understand, and I made this personal, I want you to make it personal, only when I understand that Jesus gave me his life, only when I understand that will I be able to love unselfishly. Here's the way the Apostle Paul puts it, Galatians 2 verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the attitude we need to have in order to love like Jesus loved. So do you know that Jesus loves you? Third, the love of Jesus was and is undeniable. True love is always serving, it's doing, it's ministering, it's not just talking. Jesus showed his love through his many miracles of healing, provision, and nobody could deny the fact that he had performed these miracles, whether it was raising the dead, whether it was causing the lame to walk, the blind to see, turning water into wine. Jesus, by those acts of kindness, showed what it means to love others. And I'm just going to mention one of his many miracles recorded for us in Matthew chapter 14. We like to refer to it as the feeding of the 5,000. But before Jesus fed the multitude, Matthew writes in verse 14, When he, Jesus, came ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. It was after this that his disciples encouraged Jesus to tell the crowd to go home because they were in a place that was far away from their villages. It was then that Jesus fed the 5,000, and that number did not include the many women and children who were there. Scholars believe it was up to 15,000 that he probably fed with those five loaves and two fish. So how does this apply to us today? We're not going to be able to feed five, 10, 15,000 people with five loaves or, or two fish. So how does that apply to us? It's this simple. Deeds, not words, are what God looks for when he checks our love. I remember reading this Peanuts cartoon. 
that shows an intellectual pianist by the name of Schroeder who was practicing on the keyboards very intensely. Well, Lucy was one of Schroeder's greatest admirers, and she would often interrupt him with a curious question because he was so intelligent. So one day she asked Schroeder, do you know what love is? And Schroeder kind of shrugged his shoulders and pretty frustratingly stopped his practice, stood up in a very somber, straightforward tone, turned to Lucy and said, love, noun, to be fond of, a strong affection for, attachment to, or devotion to a person. There it is, Lucy. And he sat back down and began to play the piano. Lucy gazes into this deep reflection, and then she says, on paper, he's great. Her sentiments capture the weakness of what is often described as abstract love. A love that knows what to say, but not what to do. It can be cold, calculated, well-worded, yes, but lacking warmth and genuineness. Schroeder did what many Christians do. Say all the right words about love, but don't put them into action. Do the wrong thing. We must put love into action. That's why John wrote in 1 John 3, 18. He said, little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Jesus touches on this in his passage in Matthew 25 or the passage in Matthew 25 where he's talking about the final judgment and he says beginning in verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world and then he describes what I think is true love for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. That's the love of Jesus. It is the practical deeds of service that make our love undeniable. Fourth characteristic, the love of Jesus was and is unrestrained. Now, here's what I mean by that. Jesus held nothing back when it came to the love that he had for all people. A truth that you probably already know about love is that true love is extremely vulnerable. Think about this for a moment. Jesus' love got him crucified on a cross because there was no restraint in how Jesus showed his love. Love makes us open up, makes us expose ourselves, makes us vulnerable. You love anyone wholeheartedly, and your heart may be broken. And because of this, many people are afraid to love. Sometimes we hide behind masks and false fronts because there exists this deep fear that if we should open up, someone will take advantage of us. If you reach out in love to another person, you're going to take a risk. That person may reject your love, may disappoint you, hurt you, let you down in some way. And I'm guessing the great majority, if not everyone here today, has been burned in some time in your life. You took the risk. You cared deeply about another person. And that person rejected you. And now you carry an emotional scar. And sometimes the hurt is so deep, it's hard to take the risk of loving again. Listen, when we love people, we're bound to get hurt. Sometimes that happens. Love is giving. Love is not expecting anything in return. And yet when we don't receive it in return, it's hard to keep loving. In Jesus' day, there was a philosophical school became even more prominent first and second centuries it was known as the Stoics Stoic philosophy was basically this don't show any emotion don't care about anyone or anything so how would they do that they simply didn't get involved with people 
Today's society is very similar. We use a different word. We call it apathy. It's when no one wants to get involved. We're afraid to love because we don't want to become vulnerable. I like how C.S. Lewis puts it when he said this, and I quote, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anyone and your heart will possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, your heart will change. It won't be broken. It will become impenetrable, irredeemable. And then C.S. Lewis closed by saying this, The only place outside heaven where you can perfectly be safe from all the dangers of love is hell. If we're truly going to love as Jesus did, our love must know no restraints. So I want to just challenge you all today. I know it's hard sometimes. But we need to open up. We need to build these deep relationships. We really need to get to know others so we can see a need and meet a need. And then realize unrestrained love is always sacrificial. There wasn't a limit to what Jesus' love would give, to where his love would go. There was no demand that could be made upon it that was too much. I've often thought about this question because I was asked this question many years ago, and it really caused me to think. The question was this. Do you think Jesus wanted to die? Good question. Well, first, I would answer, obviously, he did because he wanted to save us from our sins. Obviously, he knew what his purpose for being here on earth was. But from a purely physical perspective, I don't think Jesus wanted to die. After all, the Bible says he sweat great drops as if blood. He cried out for deliverance to God. But he wasn't about to let his own physical desires stand in the way of his love for us. And if love meant the cross, Jesus was prepared to go, and he did. He was willing to sacrifice his own life because of his love for you and for me. Sometimes we make the mistake in thinking that love is meant to give us happiness. And ultimately, it usually does, but it may well be that love will bring pain first. And we know that love demands a cross. The sacrifice of what is dear to us. The giving up of certain things for the sake of those that we love. Now, we will seldom, if ever, be called on to make such a sacrifice that demands the giving of our life. It may happen. But we are called upon to make those daily sacrifices of our time, our energy, sometimes our money, our own personal pleasures and desires in order to minister to others. Paul puts it good in Ephesians 5, verse 2. He says, And walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And that's the kind of love the world will notice, especially in a culture that is so selfish, so self-centered. Is our love unrestrained? Is it open? Is it vulnerable? Is it sacrificial? Or... Are we holding out loving others because of a fear of being hurt? Fifth characteristic, the love of Jesus is this. The love of Jesus was and is unending. That's how John describes his love. John 13 verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, now remember, this is the same night, this is when Jesus gave this command. Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
His love was unending. It still is today. Jesus loved his disciples as long as his love could do anything to reach them. And that love reached out to everybody. His love even included Judas. Jesus never gave up on his disciples. He loved them and he loves us in spite of weaknesses, in spite of problems and imperfections. What a great example for us to follow. There was no failure, no misunderstanding that Jesus could not forgive. His love never, ever quit or gave up on them or on us. I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this, and this is the best I could come up with. But most of you know I'm a baseball fan. Baseball is my favorite sport. The World Series just started, and my Cincinnati Reds are again not in it. You know, I've been following the Reds since I was just a wee little boy, and I'll tell you how old I'm getting. I remember listening to Wade Hoyt on the radio with Joe Nuxhall. Now, if you listen to Wade Hoyt, you've been around a while because he's been gone a while. But he was the first voice of the Reds that I listened to. But here's what's interesting to me in these days of specialization. It's rare to see a professional baseball pitcher last through nine innings of a game. used to be that way all the time, but not today. If a pitcher goes nine innings in a baseball game, it's called going the distance or a complete game. But more often than not, a pitcher grows tired. His fastballs start to lose a little of their zip. The curveballs are not as sharp as they were at the beginning of the game. And so during the game, the manager goes to the mound and signals to the bullpen for a relief pitcher. And especially in recent years, and I especially noticed that this year in the playoffs, the strength of a professional baseball team is many times now being judged by the strength and performance of those relief pitchers who come in and complete the game. Now here's why I share that. In these days of selfishness, these days of putting ourselves first, it is rare to see a love that lasts, that is unending, that goes the distance. Far too often, those of us who should be demonstrating this kind of love grow tired and weary as the game of life goes on. Our demonstrations of love are not as caring and compassionate as they used to be. They're not as Christ-like as they used to be. Isn't it time that we begin to love others with that unending love of Jesus that heals, a love that goes the distance, a love that finishes its work? It is love which identifies you and me as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone has rightly said, the world will not care what we know until they know that we care. The mark of a true Christian is love, a love that is shown through a decision that we make to meet the needs of those that we love. Now, as I've looked over these passages and over the last two to three weeks, as I've studied and prepared for these messages, there was one question, a challenging question that came coming to my mind, and I hope maybe it's coming to your mind today. How do I know if I'm truly being a loving Christian? Good question. Well, there was one verse that kept coming to my mind, It's a verse that doesn't even mention love. But I think it is how we are to show love to others. And maybe the reason why this verse keeps coming to my mind is because that's what we're studying on Sunday night in the book of Galatians. And we just talked about chapter 6 and verse 2. And here's what Paul writes. Bear or carry one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is love. Well, how do we do this? You can bear another's burdens by, first of all, praying for them. Not just saying, I'll pray for you, which we do, but saying, let me pray with you right now. In saying that, you're declaring, 
You intend to pray for them now and that you intend for them to hear you as you carry their burden to the very throne of God. That's one way you can bear one another's burdens. You can also bear one another's burdens by meeting a need as you see it. It might be a financial need. Maybe it's making food and taking it to a shut-in. Maybe it's visiting someone in the hospital or nursing home. There's all kinds of ways that we can meet a person's need. I read a story about a young man who was on his first date with this girl that he'd been, I mean, he wanted to go out with for a long time, and he thought he was, I mean, he's really in love with this girl. So they're on their first date. He's walking her home, and he wanted desperately to give this girl a kiss. But having been raised in a strict family <laughs> religious background, he hesitated Silently, he looked toward the heavens, and he posed this question, Father, Father, up above, should I kiss this girl I love? And out of the heavens came this big, booming voice, Sinner, sinner, down below, puck her up and let her go. <laughs> no, that didn't really happen, but I thought it was a good story. <laughs> At this very moment, here's the application of this. At this very moment in your life, there are people who need you. There are people who need your love. They need your help. They need your support. They need what you can do for them. So my encouragement is don't be afraid to reach out to them, to talk with them, to listen with understanding, to open your heart to them, to give them hope and encouragement. In short, don't be afraid to love them. Because I believe God is saying to each of us, center, center, down below, pucker up and let love go. Show love to others. What is it in Jesus that still draws people to him today? What is it that wins their allegiance away from every other master, makes them ready to leave all for his sake and to follow him through the trials and temptations of life? Love is the secret. Jesus came into this world to reveal the love of God. Men and women saw it in his face, felt it in his touch, heard it in his voice. The power of Jesus' attractiveness was the power of love. As we show that same love, people will be drawn to the Savior. Yes, the love of Jesus was and is unconditional, unselfish, undeniable, unrestrained, and unending. I want to end today with this true story, and I, I may have shared this many years ago, but I thought that's an appropriate way to end today. Praise team's going to come get ready to sing. But the story is told by an evangelist by the name of Fred Craddock. And it's about his father. And as I first read this story many years ago, I couldn't help but get the impression that his dad had been hurt by some people in the church that he attended for many years. Well, he left that church. He felt upset. He felt uh, people were not treating him the way he felt he should be treated. And so for years, this church that Fred Craddock's dad went to had reached out to him to come back. But he always rejected their offers to go back to church with this one statement. He said, all they ever want is another name and another pledge. Meaning they just want his body in a pew and his money in an offering plate. And that's what he felt. And year after year, that's what Craddock's father always said, except for one time. Greg Craddock tells about how his father had gotten cancer and he had finally gone to a VA hospital to receive proper care. And over a period of time, this once burly man wasted down to 78 pounds. Craddock hadn't been to the VA hospital for a while. When he got there this one day and visited him, he was shocked at his father's frail appearance. He was also shocked by what was in the room. It was absolutely full of flowers and cards and well wishes. 
As Craddock went about the room looking at the flowers and reading their cards, he was struck by the fact that for the most part, they had all come from the very members of the church that his father had for so many years rejected. His father motioned him to the bed, and because he could not speak due to the cancer, he weakly wrote these words on his notepad, words from Hamlet, draw your breath in pain as you tell my story. Fred looked at the note, and he turned to his dad, and he said, what's your story, Dad? His father wrote three words on the envelope. I was wrong. I was wrong. And Fred knew what his dad meant. That church had loved Craddock's father. And because they loved him, they gave God the room and the time to change that man's heart. All because they were committed to following Jesus' command to love one another. And I hope that you and I will be able to do that. To love one another as Jesus has loved us. But I'm convinced that we cannot truly show that kind of love until we've laid hold of the love that Jesus had for us. And we accept that love. We become part of his family. The Holy Spirit now comes to live with us. And he helps us to love like Jesus loved. Because I can't do that on my own. And neither can you. But with the help of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the empowerment of his Holy Spirit, we can love one another as Jesus loved us.